I'm Melanie Schock, and I thank you for joining me for a few minutes to discuss what I feel are a few demands of women in crisis leadership. This is a season like no other any in our lifetime has ever experienced. 2020 has left all of us reeling. If you would have told any of us on New Year's Eve what this year held, we would have all disbelieved you. Too much, we would have said. Insanity. We can't. We won't survive it. And just look. Here we are. So far, we have survived it. Some of us feel we have not survived it very well, but at least we're still here. And if you're watching this, more than likely you're in the position of being known as someone who can help others survive it as well. And that's where more, sometimes, of the stress and the worry comes in. How can I help anyone else navigate these waters, we ask, when I don't even know how to do this myself? Well, obviously, I don't have all the answers. As someone who spent the entire month of July fighting COVID and then lost my elderly mom on August 5th because of complications from it, I have struggled to keep my own head above the water. I have fought all the spirits and the emotions that seem to accompany this year. The spirit of fear, the spirit of lethargy, the spirit of anger, and the emotions of defeat and sadness and grief. All the same spirits and emotions I imagine many of you have experienced and are still experiencing. So how do we, as women in ministry and women in church leadership, lead others when we are all struggling to survive in this turbulent, turbulent season? There are obvious answers you would expect me to say. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. Trust. Have faith. Speak life. Don't lose hope. All of the things that you've probably told yourself and told other people too. But for just a few minutes, I'm going to add seven additional demands. I believe these times of crisis demand of us as women in ministry and leadership. You may want to write these down and go back and reflect on them later in your God Connection time. So, are you ready? The most important crisis demand, in my opinion, is that of activating the principle a first. I have told this story many times, but many years ago, as a 14-year-old girl, I heard Nona Freeman, our beloved veteran missionary to South Africa, talk about how she was a night person, not a morning person. As someone who is not naturally a morning person, my ears perked up because I wanted to know if there was hope of being saved if you didn't like to get up with the sun and wanted to sleep a little longer. I found out that there was. Sister Freeman gave me that hope. As a night person, she would frequently stay up late, and then when it was time to get up, she would sleep into the last possible second and then scramble to get out of bed, get dressed, and go straight into whatever was being demanded of her that day. No matter how good her intentions, she would never have even a few minutes to give to God before she began her day. She said she finally prayed, Lord, if you will wake me just 15 minutes before my alarm wakes me, I promise I will devote that 15 minutes to you every single day. She said from that day until the time of her speaking that I was listening to, the Lord had never failed to wake her 15 minutes before she had to get up each morning. I will confess I didn't pray that prayer right then, but years later when I realized the principle of first was what was missing in my life, I prayed what I now call the Nona Freeman prayer for night people. And I can assure you God answers it. So don't pray it unless you really want him to. But the reason this principle is so important during crisis leadership is because we must keep our ears open for his voice before any demand of the day creeps in. Only he knows what that day will bring. No text on our phone is more important than his voice. The weather forecast is not more important than his voice. Facebook and Instagram and Twitter have nothing more important than his voice. There is no news anywhere in the world more important than his voice. Believe it or not, our spouse's voice is not more important than his voice. Give him 15 minutes and listen. Listen to him. Read his word. Ask him to speak and then listen Don't fill the time with your words. Listen for his. A practice which has become totally essential to me 
is to read through the Psalms a chapter at a time, first thing every morning, beginning with chapter 1, and each day going to the next chapter all the way through chapter 150. When I finish, then I, I start over. I have a notebook beside my bed. And I write down the things I hear him say in that first 15 minutes, even sometimes when I feel they don't make sense. More often than not, you will find the psalm you have read and the words he will speak will give you specific direction for something which will happen later in the day. I challenge you to try this. This principle of first is a must during times of crisis leadership. If there's any certainty in all of our uncertainty, it is that. Hurting people hurt people. As a ministry leader, you must not be a part of that equation. In times of crisis, we must love people without an agenda. Let them know there is someone who will put an arm around them without judgment, without complaint, without demand, and will help them call upon the God of peace. Jesus was in the greatest crisis of his life during his arrest his trial, his crucifixion, but we cannot find where he was sensitive, lashing out or retaliating in any of his reactions. Rather, we hear him say, Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. So number two, don't be sensitive. The third crisis demand of women in these times would be refocus your priorities. Somehow, it seems the tide of popular action of women in ministry and leadership during the past several years has been to prioritize events and programs, conferences, special Sundays, programs of planning this and decorating that and speaking at this and organizing that have been the norm. Sometimes I wonder how in the world our priorities became so event-oriented. I would like to suggest to you that we all need to work on refocusing our priorities to become need-oriented instead of event-oriented. Who knows whether or not we will even be able to have events for the foreseeable future. I mean, I'm speaking to you through media and not in person at a general conference seminar right now. Who would have ever guessed we would be experiencing that in 2020? Could it be that we may have gotten sidetracked with our events? And forgot about the needs of the saved and the lost to which we have been called. I know each of your lives are incredibly different. So I'm not even suggesting a pattern or an absolute here. I'm just saying to take your time with God and ask him which priorities you may be stressing about, which are yours and not his. Refocus your priorities. Let us spend more time on meeting needs instead of worrying about our events. Our fourth crisis demand is one with which many of us struggle and would rather not hear, and that is be flexible. Our organized, list-making, efficient friends have an added pressure during this season of cancellation with being flexible. Going with the flow, smiling when the plans are changed, not stressing when the same rules which applied last week do not apply this week. Loving even when those people don't want to follow all of the new rules which keep changing. You are not called to perfection or to well-oiled machines or even to Instagram pictures of efficiency. We are here to facilitate his love and his peace and his assurance that he is with us. God is wanting to speak to us as his bride during these times and he's wanting to lead us in new paths with new ways, with a new focus. And he's wanting to prune away so many of the non-essentials and non-kingdom ideas and methods and priorities we have incorporated as important and absolute. In reality, so many of these things have simply become idols to us. And they're hiding the real purpose to which God has called us. Be open to what he would like to strip away from you. Be in tune with what he would like to birth in you. Let go of the life preserver of your comfortable and familiar way of doing things and trust his voice to guide you into the new realms of power and following his voice. So be flexible. And in light of the fourth crisis demand of flexibility, I would like to submit to you that our fifth crisis demand is have structure. 
As I was describing the fourth demand, many of our less organized, more in tune with our feelings friends were thinking, amen, that's right, you tell them. Well, I did. So now let's talk about structure. I have felt from the beginning of this change to our lives, which began occurring this past March, that an accompanying spirit with all of the shutdown and isolation issues was a spirit of lethargy. Each day, coming and going, much is the same as the one before and the one after. No real need to accomplish or to focus. It was lethargic, eating too much, letting personal disciplines go, dressing differently, different habits. I would like to propose that in order to hear the voice of God and rise to meet the purpose he is putting before us at this moment, demands structure. Keep daily disciplines. Don't lose intentionality. Spend time each morning getting his instructions for the day. Don't let minutes and then hours ooze away. Pray with David in Psalm 90 and 12. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And the sixth demand would be teach, teach, teach. Teaching does not necessarily mean standing at a podium with a group watching you. Everybody has at least one person who listens to what they say. Some have a few, some have a household, or entire congregations, or online groups, or whatever. The list goes on. But whatever your sphere of influence may be as a woman in leadership, share what you are receiving from the Lord. Don't be someone who criticizes the reactions of others if you aren't sharing what you feel yourself. Our present restrictions have only increased our ability to share. So use whatever means you're comfortable with, the telephone or email or written cards, Skype, FaceTime or Zoom, small groups, in person, one-on-one. -on -one. Just share what you know. Pray with people. Have a Zoom prayer meeting. Send out the word overwhelmed and ask a group of women to bring their thoughts to a Skype session at a given time. Talk about fear. Talk about priorities. Talk about the principle of first. Share these seven little points that I'm sharing with you, with others. Ask them to share them with their friends. Talk about being flexible, about having structure. Don't allow the enemy to silence your voice through quarantine and isolation. Let it explode your reach. And number seven, lead without words. Rather than a direct contradiction of the previous crisis demand we just talked about, leading without words is perhaps the loudest and the most important part of what we do in times of crisis. Leading without words means you're leading from your core, your essence, the absolute core of who you are, how you live your life and draw your strength. This involves laying all your fears and your conflicts and your grief and your issues at the feet of the king in private before you attempt to help others. Do a study of that word overwhelmed from the word of God. Don't go to a dictionary. Go to the word of God. Look up the Hebrew word for it, H3680 in Strong's, which is kasa. Look up that meaning and study all of the responses people did when they were totally covered up by fear and horror and grief. Look up the word a tough, H 5848 in Strong's, which describes us when we are feeble and weak. What were the responses of those in scripture to a tough? One such response, when my heart is overwhelmed, a tough, feeble and weak, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You cannot lead where you have not been. You cannot inspire peace if you aren't peaceful. You can't offer strength if you aren't strong. You cannot example stability if you aren't stable. And you can't help those you lead conquer being overwhelmed if you haven't conquered it yourself. Leading without words means you go ahead of the crowd, alone, through the dark and the rocky path, through the valley of the shadow, with only his hand to hold. And you discover the strength and the peace and the direction and the confidence 
which dwell there. You find the table prepared in the middle of the ravenous wolves and the fires of anger and rage, and you sit at that table. You fill yourself with his goodness. You find your anointing in the cleft of the rock, and you hide there as the oil runs from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And then, as your face shines with the glow of his presence, all you have to do is turn and look at those following you, and they immediately know you have found the way to the king. Times of crisis demands kingdom leadership from us through the principle of first, through not being sensitive, to refocusing our priorities, to being flexible, but yet having structure, teaching, and leading without words. If we will do these things, we can all hear his voice, follow his instructions, travel the brand new roads, and ascend to the new heights he is waiting to take his people. May God richly bless every one of you.